There are a lot of limitations despite the, the revolution that has been uh, uh, occurred in bladder cancer in second line therapy. Uh, the revolution basically was um, represented by the advent of immunotherapy and Pembrolizumab was one of the first uh, drugs that has been uh, uh, compared with the standard of care uh, chemotherapy um, according to investigator choice in second line therapy uh, in the, in the Kino 45 study. Uh, Many, many issues still uh, remain open to the, to the, to the discussion, uh, mainly related to the patient selection. Uh, and uh, the most important issue now that we are facing as investigators as well as as clinician is to try to envision the future of, uh, of sequencing new drugs uh, in the right way for, for patient diagnosed with bladder cancer. Uh, based on the fact that uh, there are a striking revolution occurring also in the first line with the advent of this the immunotherapy using the same drug in an early disease setting. Uh, so meaning that if we combine uh, therapy, immunotherapy with first line chemotherapy and we obtain, as we will see during this Congress, uh, potentially practice changing results in terms of survival by using these drugs up front, there may be a huge problem in second line uh, with, mm, using this, uh, this same compound uh, as, um, uh, as is the case, for example, with pembrolizumab as well as for other four checkpoint inhibitors that has, have been approved uh, is a standard of care for second line therapy uh, in, um, in unselected patients. Uh, of course, the data from, uh, that came out from, uh, from the checkpoint, the, the keynote of the 45 study uh, were outstanding. Uh, the pembrolizumab got approval based on the, the first uh, compound actually um, uh, who has got approval based on the phase three data in comparison with standard of care. Uh, of course, uh, we will see in, the, in this Congress that uh, the updated data in the, in the lo with longer follow-up, with three-year follow-up uh, from Keynote 45, of course, suggests that the, 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 the results that we have observed and that we have reported at the beginning are maintained over time. Uh, the duration of response and the median duration of response have been achieved uh, with uh, 29.1 months in this, uh, in this patient, so um, suggesting that the profile of patients who respond to immunotherapy uh, is, uh, is really good. The patients who respond to immunotherapy and uh, the response rate is confirmed about 20% with pembrolizumab have a good chances of uh, maintaining the response over time. So this is the actually, actually the, the true added value of immunotherapy alone compared to chemotherapy. How does it translate into a survival benefit into a paradigm change in this patient. Uh, to answer this question, I think that we should contextualize this advance in, uh, in the entire paradigm change uh, that we are facing in, uh, in bladder cancer patients. The new data coming from the use of immunotherapy in first line, but we also have a lot of trials of going uh, investigating on the use of a combination therapy, combination immunotherapy, in, even in early disease setting like a muscle invasive tumor or even non-muscle invasive tumor. Meaning that probably uh, we should be smarter in uh, best selecting patients according to biomarkers. So the Kino 45 study was aimed to compare uh, two years of pembrolizumab versus uh, standard of care chemotherapy according to investigator choice, uh, deciding, on, uh, deciding between taxanes, docetaxel, opaclitaxel, and uh, vinflunin. Uh, the study was, um, was aimed to, to improve the overall survival of these, um, of these patients. And actually, uh, the study resulted in, uh, in improved uh, overall survival, in significant improved overall survival, significantly improved uh, response rate. Uh, the only endpoint that was not improved, apparently, uh, was uh, progression-free survival, because the median progression-free survival, also in, uh, in the updated data, is not uh, so, uh, so improved compared to chemotherapy standard, but probably uh, is uh, mainly due to the, to, the, to the kinetics of response and to the way that these patients respond to immunotherapy, of course, because if you see that the, the landmark of three years PFS uh, percentage is about uh, 30%, and this uh, is very, very good compared to, to chemotherapy. Of course, there is another point which is really, really related, by, um, related to the safety profile. Uh, 
uh, and of course for frail patients, for heavily protected patients, of course safety profile is of paramount importance and the safety was uh, maintained, safety data were, uh, have been confirmed in long term uh, compared to the early data that have been published in New England. Um, and of course this, uh, this, is a, this was a, an ideal premise to combine this drug with, uh, with chemotherapy or with other agents and there is there is a plethora of uh, clinical trials so far in the same second line, second third line setting with, uh, with combining pembrolizumab with a lot of other compounds, targeted therapy, other immunotherapy, chemotherapy. And so envisioning the future of the next generation combination therapy is uh, really, really difficult based on the fact that we are still looking at early stages. So it's impossible today to envision a future for, uh, for the next generation studies. Well, the role of PD-1 expression is still uh, largely unknown, uh, mainly in the second line because uh, there is a label for the first line, it's an ineligible patient to receive uh, checkpoint inhibitor, pembrolizumab or tezolizumab only if they have a PD-1 positive tumor. Uh, this label is based on the interim analysis of uh, Invigor 130 and the Keynote 361 data and uh, partly probably we will see uh, in this, uh, this meeting uh, the, the reason why the label, uh, was, uh, was, uh, this label was set. Um, but in the second line setting, in the same clinical setting of the Kinet 45, it's extremely difficult to envision a future of biomarkers because of uh, the, uh, there are dynamic biomarkers, so the PD-1 expression may, be, may have a role in first line, but may, this may change in the second line uh, after treatment. So, uh, if a patient has failed a lot of prior line of treatment, the, the, the expression of the biomarker is the very difficult to, to use uh, to, to, to select the right treatment, of course. And, uh, and we are still looking at the next generation biomarkers that may be more, probably more reliable, like RNA expression, uh, subtyping, or molecular subtyping, or, or DNA alteration that may, TNB, for example that may guide the more reliable patients for, uh, for to receive the right, the right treatment. The many studies that are being planned with pembrolizumab, I think that the, the most striking results uh, that have been presented here uh, with pembrolizumab combination are relative to the, pembro to the combination of pembro with, uh, or the, with the infortumab vedotin. Uh, so the ADC combined with pembrolizumab actually provided 71% response rate in the first line. Uh, so I think that uh, infortumab-pembrolizumab combination may be uh, a good option, if confirmed of course, uh, as a cisplatin-free, uh, uh, chemotherapy-free option to compare with, uh, with the new standard of care which may be present, represented by immune immunotherapy plus chemotherapy in the near future, I guess. Uh, I think that we are still at the beginning of this, uh, this, uh, this study, of these results, and they should be kept as preliminary, of course. But uh, the response rate and the, and the interim look at the, 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 the PFS data are very promising. And I think it is the best combination today to use uh, regarding PEMBRO.